This is Terms of Reference, and I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Mansour Abbasi is the executive director and co-founder of the Intercivil Society, a not-for-profit company that works to help people improve their own situations by reducing poverty, protecting the environment, and improving community relationships. Mansour is an expert in training, group facilitation, and dispute resolution in both the community and workplace, with specific expertise in facilitating difficult conversations. He works as a community projects advisor and consultant designing, delivering, and managing peace-building programs in conflict areas. Mansour has worked with a range of partners and clients, including the European Parliament, West Yorkshire Police, UN Alliance of Civilization, and local and national governments and local community groups. I spoke with Mansour in the town of Brighouse, which is in the north of the UK. Mansour, thank you so very much for being on Terms of Reference today. I really appreciate your time. No, thank you for inviting me on. I'm looking where, forward. Where are we talking to you today? I am in the UK in a small town called Brighouse, which is in between Huddersfield, Leeds, Manchester and Bradford in the north of um, the UK. Tell us about... You know, what is it that the Intercivil Society does? What is it that you do for them, and what's the goal of your organization? Our tagline, if you can call it that, our main goal is really to kind of connect the unconnected. So, so we are a not-for-profit company or social enterprise, and we work in the areas of reducing poverty, climate protection, and intercultural cooperation. So we look to create opportunities to help people to improve their own situation, whether that be economic, social, or environmental. Can you give me an example of uh, specific programs that you do for either economic development or social development? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, I'll give you two. I'll give you an economic and I'll give you a, a social. An economic area of work we're working in at the moment is a project called ProWork, which is based in Greece, Portugal, Italy, and Spain. The countries in Europe that have been uh, the worst affected by the recession and they've got huge youth unemployment levels. Now, our aim is to provide opportunities for job creation where the young people themselves can set up social enterprises and, and companies to uh, enable them to provide services uh, and to connect with senior citizens from Northern and Western Europe who will come down and stay in retirement villages in these places. Uh, they'll provide services such as healthcare, legal, financial, linguistic, administrative services. They'll have shops. Basically, everyone will be encouraged to cooperate in a new cross-generational legacy enterprise startup scheme that draws on the complementary skills, capacity, energy and availability of young people and kind of hook them up with the skills, contacts, experience and, and good health of the retired citizens. So uh, is this – is is the – the scheme that you're talking about, the, this intergenerational scheme, is this a core service that the Intercivil Society has developed, or is it a, is like a proprietary way of going about doing this work? It's a proprietary core service. So we basically came up with this idea because it's really, really hard if you're a young person to get an opportunity to get a job. And even if you get a job, it's not necessarily going to be well-paying and it's going to be limited. And we were like, well, you know, instead of people having to wait around for someone to give them the opportunity, why not establish a space for them to create their own opportunities for job creation? And so we thought about renovating existing villages that have been abandoned or in disrepair or creating new purpose-built villages that will actively act as retirement villages for wealthy Northern and Western European uh, citizens who have recently retired or have retired, and they'll live in these warm sunny countries for a while, either permanently or for a few months of the year, and young people will provide all the services to them, and they'll also work together on, on, on their own projects. So, oh. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's intense. That's the, and, and this is not just an idea. This is actually happening right now. This is happening. We had our launch in Thessaloniki in Greece, which is one of the countries we're operating in, our first official launch. The mayor of Thessaloniki was invited and the press were there as well. And we received uh, high patronage from Martin Schulz, the um, uh, president of the European Parliament. So we've got their support and we're building their support through uh, key political avenues and through businesses as well uh, to kind of make this into kind of like a public-private entrepreneurial partnership where everyone can really benefit from this uh, project. Right, we're at the implementation stage, so we've done the design, we're kind of just trying to work through now and, and make it actually a reality on the ground. How did you go about, you know, that, that's very exciting that you've got the patronage of the, you know, the President of the European Parliament. How, 
How did you go about uh, securing that? My colleague, Mr. Geza Tessiani, and co-founder of the Civil Society, is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's always great when you're working with a genius. <laughs> it, it, he really is a true visionary and, and a great leader. And he basically develops these political connections and he, and, and he develops partnerships with people. And he's kind of the creative vision behind this particular project idea. And he's just been really tenacious. And over the last couple of years, you know, from the seed of an idea in his brain, he's managed to develop partnerships and get cooperation from uh, governments and, and other people and to get a, a team of young people uh, really kind of uh, excited about working on this. And he's the one really behind this. Uh, just meeting people, pushing through. When he gets a rejection or closed door, he just knocks on the next door and says, you know, we've got this great project. This would be great for everyone. Let's work together. And I don't know exactly how he does that. I think he's got some magic somewhere, but he's, really, <laughs> he's pretty cool. In that so regard. this sounds like a fairly significant project. Can you yeah. give me a sense of the kind of funding behind it and the kind of staffing that you have behind it? Okay. So uh, the company, the Civil Society, there's uh, myself and, and Geza. Uh, and then we, at the moment, we have volunteers working in uh, Greece and Portugal. But the idea is that once this project becomes self-sustaining and we gain investment and funding, for example, the European Investment Bank, one of a few places, then uh, people will be able to be employed on a full-time basis. And what would the European Bank be investing in specifically? Are they investing in the enterprises that the young people are setting up or is it a, a platform or – Yep, there will uh, hopefully. I mean, we're still in discussion, so nothing's been finalised yet. But for example, they could invest in startup enterprises uh, made by young people with older people. They could also invest in the actual uh, residential villages themselves, the construction of that. Because I mean, if you're renovating a village or creating a new village, there's huge administrative uh, tasks that need to be sorted out, and also in terms of developing uh, infrastructure, transport. And all that kind of stuff. Uh, so investing in those kind of schemes together with government funding as well uh, and local government funding, uh, that's kind of where we're looking to go on that score. Mm. So this was your this was your economic example. Did you have a, a different one for social development? Yeah, for, so for social development, and this is kind of more of the work uh, I, I've been concentrating on, is a, a youth uh, leadership program, an intercultural youth leadership program in West Yorkshire. Uh, in the UK, uh, working with three secondary schools, three high schools, uh, working with kids around the age, between the ages of 13 to 15, creating a critical mass of young leaders who have been skilled up in really the kind of attributes and skills we think community leaders should have and enabling them to engage with decision makers, policy makers and wider communities to not only represent young people's voices to get them out there because we think that these voices are ignored but also to act as positive peer role models as well and to kind of just motivate other people and help people to improve their environment and community relationships wherever yeah. they live. So the goal there would be building youth community leaders to actually become advocates, to become politicians, to become what? Yeah, yeah uh, kind of uh, uh, identifying young people with either leadership potential or who are already leaders in their own right. So we know in like 10, 20, 30 years they will be there making the decisions and stuff. And it's actually grabbing them at that age where we can say, okay, this is the kind of uh, uh, destiny you want to have. That's fine. We'll give you the skills, but in a way, kind of give you that way of thinking. So when you do become a community leader, you do so to enable everyone to benefit, not just your particular community or your particular group of friends or your particular organization. Do you kind of know where I'm coming from? To kind of encourage partnership working, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make sure that those kind of traditional barriers that are there, cultural barriers, faith barriers, they're, they're kind of all overcome naturally because people just cooperate with each other. This youth leadership training program uh, is running in an area in West Yorkshire, which we know has problems with uh, intercultural tensions and relationships between people of different faiths. 
Uh, and these particular schools uh, have issues anyway with each other. They don't really, the school kids don't really get on. So we thought, okay, there's these issues. Let, how can we kind of address that? And because you've got communities that are living parallel lives, it's a term used in the UK in terms of you've got communities who live alongside each other. They don't necessarily fight, but they don't interact with each other. Non-integration. They're not integrated. It's like a cold peace kind of environment. You know, there's nothing really happening, but one spark and you could get tension or uh, 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 violence. We thought, okay, let's establish a core group of young people who can act as positive role models for young people and also help their communities to integrate better. And so we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? So I designed a youth leadership program that basically teaches them the kind of skills and attributes that we think good leaders should have. So we teach them critical thinking skills, emotional intelligence, ethical reasoning, power analysis, conflict resolution, communication skills, leadership, team working, filmmaking skills. And we also give them a secure environment where they're able to engage in dialogue, where they discuss and analyze the issues that really affect them as young people in how their community. How do you provide that secure environment? Okay, so we facilitate uh, safe space sessions. So um, we establish an environment where they can trust us as a facilitator to encourage them to talk in an atmosphere where they won't be judged, they won't be criticised as a person for what they say, they won't be expected to represent their whole community, they represent themselves, and they can express their opinions and exchange ideas freely in the spirit of learning from each other uh, and creating mutual trust. And as a facilitator, you are responsible for creating that environment, which is what we do. And, for example, so we did a SWOT analysis of a town of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And one of the weaknesses that came up was, for example, they didn't know who their local political representatives were. Mm. Of them. They didn't know who their politicians were. Mm-hmm. So we said, okay, that's cool. And then and another day we connected them with their politicians. So we invited a local politician to come down. They did a question and answer session with them, holding them to account, asking them very important questions uh, that these councillors were like, oh, okay, <laughs> how do we answer? Sure, oh, sure. So we're stuck in, you know, we'll give a stock political answer, and then the young person will say, no, 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 that's not, no. And they'll ask the question again, and then the, the council will have to answer. Uh, and so we hook them up with uh, decision makers and politicians. We give them chances to talk about the issues. For example, they talk about respect in terms of girls and boys, how they respect each other, how they disrespect each other, public safety, um, issues of race relations and how it affects them and what could be done to improve those. Uh, really kind of important socioeconomic and political stuff that, you know, 13 and 14 year olds are talking about and people wouldn't expect them really to, to know enough to talk about and to have a, an informed opinion, but they do. And we've made a film about the project as well, a documentary. It's all about getting their voices out there and their voices heard and it's giving them space to voice these opinions so people can listen to them and take notice. What's the name of the documentary? Uh, well, it's the Our Future, Our Keithley Leadership Program. And so we've just filmed the first one. We've finished our second year. We've got 60 young people who've gone through the program now, and we're just working on a second film for that. And we're hoping to release that at film festivals as well. How did you stumble into this work? How, you know, what's, what's, what's your background and what, what led you to become you know, the executive director of the Inner Civil Society? Uh, I started off working in IT as a business analyst. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone does, uh, doing systems development and systems integration. And it's fair enough, it's okay. But, you know, it, it kind of fed the stomach, but it didn't necessarily feed the soul, if you know what I mean. Kind of just working there, just felt like I was constantly on a treadmill and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with my life. All I knew is I just wanted to help people. So somehow or another, in 2002... I became a, a community mediator. So I started doing community mediation, mediation, and then that kind of led one thing to another. I started to facilitate town hall events, that kind of stuff. And then I was asked to, to manage a community project, which I did, and that was successful. And then I started managing other community projects. Then I started helping small grassroots community organizations in, in their developing their capacity and organizing themselves. And then from there, uh, I did a, a youth leadership program with the Intercultural Communication and Leadership School. And after that, I became more involved in their activities and started working for them 
and through them I met Geza Tessany, who was the president of the organization. Uh, and then eventually, after being their country director and, and expanding their sphere of operations and, and running programs for them, then we left to set up into civil society. So this is this is your full time gig. You're not you're not dabbling your toes, or is, is are you doing other things as well? I'm doing IT as well. Okay. So uh, IT is still paying the bills and feeding the stomach. All right. Uh, it's feeding the soul. At the <laughs> but I mean, well, a long term objective is to be able to kind of do this full time. Sure, sure, absolutely, and I hope that that becomes a reality. What can you give me a sense? So you know, you're you. It sounds like you have some fantastic projects going on already. Um, the work that you've been describing, why isn't that paying the bills for you as well? Do you have a sense? I mean, is it just because you haven't found that kind of funding or it hasn't been? It, you, you tell me. Trouble with project funding is, well, it's not really the trouble. Well, it's a trouble if you're an organization and you need to pay your bills. But the good thing about project funding is m- as much of that money should go towards the project, I believe. As, as, as So, for example, if you have... I don't know, a £100,000 budget, at least 95% of that money should go on the project. Mm. And then the rest, you know, could go to the, to, your, to the organizations like costs and all that kind of stuff. And, and in terms of running the project, that's fair enough. But you can't really make a profit from it. And, and well, you can't anyway, just because of the, uh, the, the structure of the, of, of the funding that you get. So project funding is okay for allowing you to do the work, but unless you're receiving a significant portion of that, you can't really live off it. We also receive commissions on, on work that we do. So this leadership project I'm doing, actually, I'm consulting on this project. So another organization had an idea that they wanted to do something. And then I, uh, they approached me and I helped them. And I designed this project for them. And we received a commission for doing so. So that commission then pays the organization's bills. But I don't really take a salary from that. That's the difficulty with it. I mean, it's great we have this opportunity to do the work, but in terms of growing the business so we can have a salary, we're uh, still trying to make that a possibility. Tell me about how it is you go about seeking new funds. It's um, it, it sounds like your partner does most of that, or are you involved in that? Is there a process that you use? Is it haphazard? T- tell me about how you go about fundraising. Okay, actually, we kind of both do uh, the same type of fundraising. Because I'm actually delivering this project and a few other projects, what happens is once you've delivered, word of mouth spreads about the project. So what we hope is that we have a body of work that we can then say to people, we have these services that we provide. You've seen how good we are. Do you want to work with us? Uh, for example, this project I'm working on, the Keithley one, is a three-year project. It's we've be, it's been extended by at least another year because the funders are happy with it. But also, other people would like to work with us, and there's a chance of extending this project into other areas in the district and maybe to make it run nationally. So that's one way of kind of fundraising by actually doing something that then people look at and say, you know what, that's great, we want a piece of this, and then you mm-hmm. can say, okay, that's cool, you know, we'll provide the services. You pay us a fee, and we'll do it that way. Uh, so and that's would those, would those funds come from. Wealthy individuals uh, from local community governments, or is that from the community itself? Uh, no. So, for example, this Keithley project was funded by Joseph Roundtree Care Trust, which is a charity in the UK that provide funding to community groups to run specific projects. Okay. So, uh, for example, if we were to extend this across other schools in Bradford, we would look to funding from the local government. If we were to extend it nationally, uh, we would look for funds from the, uh, the British government, or uh, we would look to extend uh, to get funds from other charitable uh, trusts that provide money that way. Communities themselves wouldn't actually pay. We would never actually charge an individual to attend one of these courses. Mm. And that's the course if it was in a professional uh, sphere, and then we would charge companies for our services that way. Sure. For, for example, for uh, a Professionals would need intercultural training, that kind of stuff. So does that um, also, that same philosophy, bleed over into the economic development project you were talking about earlier where you've received a grant of some kind and that's giving you your setup and the hope is ultimately that it becomes self-sustaining through offering businesses, services, and products? Yes. Okay. So riddle me this. (laughs) You're Uh part-time. You do IT work to, as you say, keep the belly full. How does that work out in terms of dividing your time, in terms of where, you know, if you have a commitment on your, you know, sorry, for your professional commitments with IT, do you have to then, you know, slack off or for lack of a better term, you know, 
postpone or delay your your process with with your community development work. How do you balance those two lives in a way that you're able to make sure you're delivering professionally for both of them at the same time? You stay hyper organized and you don't sleep. <laughs> tell me, tell me about that. We all got to sleep. I know. Well, the thing is, you can't compromise. Well, people do, but I I, I don't like to compromise on on my. Uh, delivery of any kind of service or on my professionalism. So when I do work, I'm doing my IT work. And what I'll do is, in terms of the, the, the company's activities, I'll schedule that in to time when I'm not doing my IT work. So because the thing is, the, the, the work has to be delivered, whether you're doing the IT or, or, or work for the company. Mm. So I just make sure there's no clashes, and if there are clashes, then I, I'll say, look, you know, I'm sorry, I can't make this appointment, let's just reschedule. Because you can always reschedule a meeting. Uh, and also in terms of delivering a program, I'll look at my calendar and I'll say, well, you know, for three months I'll be doing this project. I know my capacity. I know I won't be able to do anything else. So I won't do anything else until three months have passed and I know I've got a, a, a window of opportunity there. And then I'll schedule a project in, you know, for maybe three months down the line or something like that. You have to be organized. You have to be strong. And I guess you have to know when to say no as well. Those are, those are uh, fantastic because if reasons. you say yes to everything and you promise everyone that you can deliver, chances are you can't, and you can't let people down. Mm. You really can't let people, especially if you're in a position of responsibility where you've promised to deliver something and they're, they're expecting you to do that, but they're depending on you to do that. And if you don't deliver, it doesn't matter what excuse you give, you fail them. So and that's really what I try to avoid. I'd love to learn what specific tools you have. You know, what is is it? You know, is there a brand that you use? You know, what is it specifically used to stay organized? I've got a Mac, so I normally use Mac tools. So I've got the calendar, and I've got. I also use a Microsoft Project because I've got a PC as well. That's specifically when I'm doing my project management work. But in terms of keeping myself organized on a day-to-day basis, I use a product called Evernote, which is fantastic. It's like a notebook where you can cut and paste uh, images in and documents, and it's just really well organized so you can see everything at once. So, for example, if you're writing all your lists in a diary, you have to go to a specific day to see what you did uh, or what you're going to do, whereas on, Edmo- on Evernote, <laughs> everything is there visually just in your eye line, and you can choose from a particular notebook. You can cut and paste images. It's just very, very useful as, as a tool and I just make lots and lots of lists I let, make lists of what I have to do then I scratch off yes I've done this I've done that I make lists of what I have to do in the future and also uh, I can use this on my iPhone as well uh, so my work is always with me mm. which is good so I'm always up to date so you're so making sure that you're always up to date making sure that you have your list with you is a, is a, a critical part of your it's, success it's mission critical yeah I, I don't know about success but it's mission critical because my brain is like Swiss cheese my memory is really really bad uh, so I need to be able to have all my information on hand so I can just see it and remind myself and I think okay I've got to do this I've got to do that do you see do you find yourself sharing these tools with others in your project like the the beneficiaries of your work or or anything like that? Are you evangelical about it? Uh, not really evangelic, ev- evangelical. We have different ways of working. However, uh, Yammer is a great tool. Y a double m e r. It's like Facebook, but for companies. So it's a closed social networking tool, uh, but your employees can use, and it's a shared space for. Uh, you can you have like a page for a specific project. You you, you can instant message. Each of uh, you can post notices and you can have conversations on there as well. It's a great way for sharing uh, 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 work on projects. And then we use Dropbox as well for sharing documents. Uh, and we use Skype for instant messaging. It's, so there's a few tools like that. We use. So it sounds like as well, if I, if I can make the leap, that uh, you're, you're using, you know, you're basically a virtual organization. Uh, yes, because we have... Uh, international team members. Uh, we are actually uh, a, a, limit, uh, a company limited by shares, so we have members, uh, but who are also shareholders. And uh, we've got a member f- in Japan. We've got a, 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 a few members in the UK, but then we also work with people internationally in Greece and Portugal. I've worked with people in Israel and Palestine. It's all through Skype. You know, I've managed teams virtually just through Skype. Mm. I, I, not only do I respect it, I love it. I mean, that's, that's, we've been doing that for a long time ourselves. What made you choose the company limited by shares rather than a charity status or 
some well, other structure? If you're a company limited by shares but with an offer profit clause in your constitution, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. It means you can uh, uh, work... Uh, in a commercial sense and, and generate a profit, but then that profit is not distributed to the members. That profit can then either allow you to work pro bono in other areas or it can be used, it can be distributed to, to, to good causes and that kind of stuff. So we kind of, we can work as a commercial company without the limitations of being a charity. So we can choose what uh, kind of fields we want to work in or where we want to work or who we want to work with. Obviously, not dodgy people, but so we have that flexibility. And also in terms of encouraging investment as well, you know, if someone wants to invest in the company or in a project that we have, we can maybe supply them with equity or allow them to make a profit, but that kind of helps everyone else. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah. So that kind of gives us flexibility. Really. This is but, really, this is really a hybrid. Yeah, it is. And there's lots of companies like this in the UK. It's like the new kind of thing. Uh, and there's also like a CIC, which is a community interest company, which is, again, they work on similar lines. They, they, they work on a commercial basis, but for good causes. That's and any profits they make are redistributed to good causes or to the communities, or to enable them to, to do other things. Tell me about how the inner civil society develops its strategic objectives, like the, the goals that you want to accomplish. And then how do you measure the success and failure of accomplishing those goals? Okay, uh, so our objectives really are de determined by our three kind of main spheres of uh, operation in terms of working to improve community relationships, protect the climate, and reduce poverty. So anything that kind of falls under those areas, we would consider working on. Also depends on the need in a given situation. If we feel that there's a, a need for a specific type of project that we think would bring communities together or would maybe reduce tensions in the community, we'll either design our own project or work with people who have an idea for that and we'll help them deliver. Or, for example, like the Pro Work Project, which we know there's a problem with uh, uh, unemployment. And, okay, what can we do to uh, uh, kind of help that situation, create job opportunities for people, there's the need, let's design a project that we think could actually fit those objectives. And in terms of time horizons, we can we do short-term projects in terms of the delivery is only like one day. It could be like a, a, a training workshop or it could be like an event, that uh, a campaigning event or something. But in terms of implementation and design it could take a few weeks to do or you could have the project i'm working on which is a three-year program which is medium term or pro works which is like a long-term program because we're looking for sustainable uh, development there so it, it kind of depends on what our capacity is at that moment what we want to do what the need is and if we you know can get the funds to do it is, are there are any of your members in your uh, in your company full-time or is everybody sort of wearing two hats Everyone's wearing two hats. Probably uh, three or four hats, actually. Yeah. So, for example, we have the uh, Bishop of Woolwich in uh, the UK, who was the Archdeacon of Southwark, uh, an interrela interfaith relations advisor to the Archbishop's Council. So he's a member, uh, and he kind of helps us out and gives us advice and stuff. But he's like, you know, he's, he's a bishop, so he's doing other stuff. <laughs> then we also... <laughs> We also have a, a professor of the University of Tokyo uh, and director of the Center for Sustainable Peace. Uh, so he's also a member as well. And then we have um, someone who has his own uh, media company and is doing a PhD at the London School of Economics. So it's we're all kind of engaged in our own way and we do specific uh, tasks and responsibilities, but we have our own stuff as well, which is good, I think, for the company. Because then, you know, we've got really well-rounded people who are experienced in, 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 in the world and, and doing things can, can bring those perspectives and skills to the team. Have you noticed um, that I, I personally enjoy that you call yourself a company? Uh -huh. um, have you noticed any distaste or reluctance from either funders or beneficiaries because you call yourself a company rather than an organization or a charity? No. I think... In some ways, it's worked in my benefit anyway because I don't know what it's like. Are you in Canada or America? Or? I'm calling you actually from Costa Rica, but I'm a United States citizen. So, Okay, okay, great. So like in, in the UK anyway, there's this perception that if you're in the private sector and you're a company, somehow you're automatically better than someone who works in the public sector. 
Hmm. Because you're somehow more professional and more capable, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So when people hear that your company, they automatically think, okay, they must know what they're doing because they're a company. Whereas if you're, That's a, community, brilliant. Yeah, whereas if you're a community organization, they think, oh, yeah, some volunteer or someone, no, they don't really know what they're doing. They're just trying to do it, but they're not really doing it. So in my experience, that's kind of helps. We we can't, we are though limited in terms of we can't apply to specific funders for specific things because they would only fund charities, which is fair enough. But that's why we provide consultancy services. So a charity may bid for a pot of money to a project, but we, we would actually design that project on their behalf. And right. So, yeah, so you actually and, – and have you been successful consulting into other for-profits? Like I, I think you mentioned earlier intercultural training or that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean the organization we're working with on the Scapely Project, they're a, a grassroots community organization. They basically run a community center for the local people. And they didn't have this expertise to run this kind of major project. So we came on board and we designed it and we're running it for them. But I'm also mentoring the people in that organization as well in terms of how to facilitate sessions, how to run a major project, you know, or how to cope with adversity when things go wrong. You know, you don't give up, you just kind of move on and that kind of stuff. So I kind of brought them up with us as, as we developed. So that's that's kind of what we do and it's really... It's really gratifying to know that you can help as many people as possible involved in a project. Mm. It's really cool. Not just your traditional kind of service users, but other people as well who are involved there. Everyone gets to benefit. Do you find that because you ha- have IT skills and that's your professional background that you're the IT guru for the company? <laughs> yes, to some degree. Although I'm not very good with websites. That's the one thing I refuse to get involved with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, you're in the back end. You're in the server side. Yeah, but uh, on the server side and just also in terms of knowledge and experience and, and, and kind of like how to use technology and what's out there, that kind of stuff. I find that I, I tend to help lots of people, especially with the social uh, media stuff now as well. Two more questions for you. What's, okay. what's your biggest frustration in this, you know, in being not only a you know, professional in the private sector but also working in this? It sounds like your passion lies in, in you know, community development, helping people to do these things and, and bringing you know, youth together, working on these social enterprises. Beyond sort of the fact that you aren't getting paid full-time for this, what's your biggest frustration? Is it finding funding? Is it getting beneficiaries to make real changes? What, what, when you wake up, you're like, ah, oh, I just wish. That's a good question. It's quite a juicy question as well. I could go on for quite a long time. I guess funding is always frustrating, especially because it's being reduced Uh, And you're finding organizations are scrambling for reduced pots of money all the time, and that pot is gradually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's a frustration. I think also just a frustration in terms of trying to get organizations to cooperate with each other more and to not be as territorial over their particular constituents, over, or maybe like the type of work that they do, because people say, oh, yeah, we'll work in partnership, or, you know, we should work together and stuff. And it sounds good, but in reality, a lot of organizations don't feel comfortable doing that, maybe secure mm. enough to do that, because they feel, oh, if we, if we cooperate with one organization, they might steal our work or, or, or take us over or, you know, compromise us somehow or we won't get the credit for what we want to do, all that kind of stuff. So I think, I mean, that's kind of why I kind of focus more on partnership building and, and getting people to work together to kind of overcome that. Mm-hmm. But it's, I think that's probably the hardest part of the job. That's, and, and unfortunately, it's, you know, that's not exclusive to northern UK. That's everywhere you go. It's everywhere you go, even in the all over the world. Final question: Why? You know, sorry. Final question is what? <laughs> you know, as you're working with these youth, as you tell other people at you know a cocktail hour or at a dinner party or or over lunch about what it is that you do, what advice would you give to either you know someone you're working with in one of your projects or someone just sort of looking for a career change? about how to get into this kind of work you know what do they is it is there an education piece is it an experience piece is it just jump off the cliff what what do you what's your advice it's a combination of the three things that you just mentioned i would definitely say go for it and in fact actually i had this conversation with a friend yesterday uh, she was saying oh, I, I would really love to do what you do but i can't do it i'm too old i'm stuck in my job i need to pay the bills blah 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 and i said 
You know what it is? You just have to do, you have to decide what you want to do and just go for it. And you always find a way in. It also depends on your attitude as well. And I do, when I talk to my young people and, and to anyone I really kind of give training to or advice, I say, analyze what are your motivations for doing this? You know, what's in it for you? Are you just doing it for your ego or just to feel good about yourself? To tell people, look at me, I'm doing this development work, aren't I a beautiful human being? Or is it really to kind of help people? And Because depending on what your motivation is will depend on how successful you are and what kind of kind of role you undertake and, and how frustrated you get. Because and, and, it's about really you have to kind of leave your ego at the door. You have to be prepared to help people and to take the knocks, but to just keep on going because that's what it's about. If you're just there to claim the credit or just to show people how fantastic you are, you'll have some success, but you won't necessarily get the respect. So that's one thing. Analyze why you want to get into this business. Also, don't give up. You can always find a way in, whether it's working voluntary or helping out in, in a community kitchen or doing fundraising or just even helping a, 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 an organization with its admin stuff. You, they'll get to know you, they'll see how good you are, and you can make your way in. Education is a great rule. Uh, a lot of NGOs and uh, Organizations require at least a, a degree or a master's in a political science or conflict resolution. I did an MA in conflict resolution, and that personally just helped me so much anyway in terms of educating me and making me realize actually how little I know about everything. But also in terms of opening doors as well. So if you can get educated, that's a good thing to do. Also, I think the best bit of advice that someone gave me recently was he said, uh, stop thinking about the type of person you're going to be in five years or where you want to be in five years, just be that person now. Just be that person now and just do what you need to do now and you'll get there. And that's kind of one motivation. That's when I uh, established this company with Gaze and started doing all of this uh, kind of more on my own. I was like, okay, yeah, I understand now. So I want to be, uh, I want to run my own company and I want to travel the world and help people. But in five years, no, I can do that now. That's kind of what I'm doing. So, yeah. Mansur, thank you so much for your time today. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's been great as well. Thanks for listening. <laughs> You've been listening to Terms of Reference, a weekly podcast from aidpreneur.com. Find us on our iTunes or at www.aidpreneur.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>